Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today is West Coast editor James Rizwick. Got a lot to talk about. James has been driving some really interesting cars. Uh, Ford Mustang Mach-E, the Ram TRX, uh, and an F-150, among other things. So lots of cool things there. I spent a week in the Genesis GV80. was very impressed with the style of that vehicle. Very handsome. Um, maybe a little bit over the top, but I thought it looked pretty cool. It was a beautiful shade of British Racing Green, though I don't think they called it that. Uh, so we'll get into that. A couple of quick news hits. Uh, we will break down the Jeep Grand Cherokee L, which uh, was revealed last week, and uh, some CES notes. Uh, the largest consumer electronics show in the world went virtual this year. We'll talk about that. And then finally, we have a mailbag question for you. So let's get right into it. The Ford Mach-E, one of the most anticipated vehicles of the year. Uh, we've tried it in Michigan. We've tried it in New York, actually. You were able to get one out there in Portland, Oregon, James. Um, so many things, so many directions we could go here, but initial thoughts. What did you think? I thought it was exceptional. Yeah. You know, last we at the end of the year, we did our usual, you know, best, favorite, uh, most surprising, most disappointing cars of the year. We did that on like December 15th. And I picked the RAV4 Prime just slightly over the Corvette as my best car that I drove. Uh, however, I drove the Mach-E on like December 28th, and that would have been the best car I drove in 2020. Um, it, it's, it's just so well executed. It's a proper, um, real electric car from the ground up on its own platform by a mainstream manufacturer and no offense to tesla but their manufacturing standards have consistently not been to the standards of other car companies um the, this and and to that end besides just being a full-on electric car it's actually desirable um as opposed to like a chevy bolt which is this weird roller skate looking dorky thing now, this car is not. It got lots of attention, um, parked out front, lots of people stopped looking at it. People stopped me while, while driving the thing, wanting to know about it. Um, it's really cool. It looks so much better um, in person. It looks a lot smaller in person. It's really not that big. It's very low, really um, curvaceous. I'm not a big fan of silver cars, but the one I had, it looked exceptional in it. Um, and as an electric car, um, it, it drives very well. Um, it, it, it has the, you know, that it, all electric, you know, smooth torque punch uh, that you expect. Um, they, they piped in a little bit of uh, noise into um, the acceleration when you really gun it, um, it's not contrived. It's not trying to like duplicate a V8 exhaust, but you kind of expect there to be just some noise when you really accelerate a high performance car and, and this delivers it. Um, and it, it kind of seems like just like a deep electric motor noise as opposed to a high pitched one, which you don't hear in this car. It's, it's, it's actually impressive that they've pretty much filtered that out. Um, the other thing I was really impressed with was the interior. Now, because it's a very minimalist aesthetic, this doesn't really come across in pictures. And when I saw the images, I was concerned that it would kind of be like the Ford Escape and Ford Explorer, which had well, disappointing interior quality. Um, this isn't. Um, at least the premium trim level I had you know, the plastics were of a higher standard than, than the Escape. You know, the doors are covered in a soft touch material. Kind of feels like what you get in a Lincoln. A really nice cloth uh, trim on, on the dash. And it has this gigantic screen that actually works well. A lot of these vertically oriented screens don't take um, the best use of that extra real estate. Uh, either they just try and cram as much stuff as they can, or they kind of focus more on making it look, um, you know, pretty. And But in this case, it looks good, but, you know, they use the real estate to make everything bigger. So buttons bigger, displays bigger. So just you can just more easily see things at a glance. 
um, which is good for functionality as well as just safety. You, you're not looking at the damn screen as, uh, for as long. Um, so I thought that was really good. Um, and, and, you know, it's a useful size. Um, now I think we can now talk about the Mustang element of it, and I'll kind of let you maybe talk to that and I'll go on my rant thereafter. The, uh, I'm actually kind of curious. You did a nice luggage test. Um, yeah. you got a fair amount of stuff in there. Um, mm -hmm. what do you sort of break down? You know, is this thing, is it a Mustang? Is it a crossover? Looking at the pictures, I see what you mean there about how actually it does look pretty good in silver. Um, it's got that like very fastback kind of roof line that I think you would expect. Um, my parents had an 84 Mustang that was a liftback, so I don't see what the big deal is for hatchback Mustangs. But uh, how much stuff could you get in there? And I mean, I don't know. Mustang crossover, does it matter? I don't know. You drove it. What do you think? Well, the in terms of like space, yes, it, it could fit all the luggage in my garage. And a lot of compact SUVs cannot behind the back seat. So it had more space back there than I thought. Now, it doesn't have more beyond that. Like it doesn't, it's, yes, it's a crossover, but that's really just a large trunk back there. There's not a lot of versatility you gain through, you know, like unlike an escape, the seat, the back seat doesn't slide or recline. And in fact, the back seat, though there's enough room, it's pretty kind of flat and hard. Um, but it is, it is actually perfectly um, functional. It's, and, you know, it, there's a, there's some extra storage underneath the, uh, the floor back there. There's a frunk. Um, but in terms of the Mustang thing, so I equated it to the Porsche Cayenne. Is the Porsche Cayenne a Porsche? Because, you know, it's based on a Volkswagen platform and has, shares engines with various Volkswagen entities. And people were sure pissed off when they came out with a Cayenne all those years ago. Um, but... Uh, the Cayenne was responsible for kind of saving Porsche and allowing Porsche to come out with some really awesome cars consistently over the years. Now, does this make, you know, it, it's basically a marketing exercise. That's fine. The Mustang Mach-E is absolutely a marketing exercise. And it's better for it because I guarantee you this car looks better and is better to drive because it's called a Mustang as opposed to just being the Ford Escape looking anonymous, possibly dorky EV that it could have been had they not made the last minute change to turn it into a Mustang. Um, and it's a Mustang brand. Like, what? Like, okay, there's now going to be multiple Broncos. Why can't there be multiple Mustangs? Maybe they'll add something else and we'll have like this sub brand. And, you know, this is, you know, talking about brand can be a little, you know, eye rolling for car folks, but it, it is a thing. And the Mustang brand is stronger than Ford in this, in an important area. Now, the Ford is a time honored brand. It has, it carries a lot of respect, um, but it's not a sexy brand. You know, the, the name Ford isn't going to move um, a, a new electric car in in areas and among people and amongst potential buyers who want the new sexy uh, must-have product. A Ford is not going to do that. Mustang, though, absolutely can. People know Mustang. You don't have to be a car person to know Mustang. The Mustang itself doesn't even have a Ford badge on it. It already is a sub-brand. So, you know, I, it, it's not besmirching the name Mustang. There's still a real Mustang. Um, also, the name Mustang has been applied to some, some hot garbage at times, uh, specifically in the 70s. So let's not make it out to be this godlike, revered thing. Um, so I think, you know, there is room to make it Mustangier. You know, this, the steering could be sharper and it does not feel like the regular Mustang. You know, they could turn up the performance performance-oriented elements, perhaps a bit much, but going back to the Cayenne, the Cayenne has gotten more Porsche-like with every single generation. And in the end, I think it's a good thing, and I don't think people should be cheesed off about it, because the car itself is really good, and it's better for being called a Mustang. That's an interesting take that I don't think I've ever actually heard somebody 
quite articulate that this is better because a Mustang is sort of like pulling the electric crossover into a Mustang space. You know, I agree with you completely. If they had just called this the electric edge or something or slap the Ford Flex name on it or something, it wouldn't have worked um, as well as this has. So I think, you know, I've, at first I was a little kind of on the fence, but now I'm, I'm really all in. I think, yeah, making a Mustang, make it a, who cares if it's a crossover, um, go with it, you know, make it, uh, make it like it is. I'm intrigued. I don't, Ford really hasn't said too much about this. If they could take the traditional body style of the Mustang and electrify it in some manner. Now I realize the existing platform and the dimensions might make that tricky. It might not, but there would be some challenges to take the current style of car and then, you know, essentially make an electric conversion. On the other hand, you can drop electric crate motors to almost anything you want, including like original Mustangs. So I think that would be an interesting play for them. I don't know if they'll ever do that, but there's a lot of, a lot of directions this could go. Um, and you make a great point too. I mean, I had an uncle who had like a Mustang two, I think it was like a 77 or something. <laughs> By no means was that a car that you would put in the, like, you know, the Automotive Hall of Fame or, you know, like the Mustang name has been on some things that are, you know, not great, Bob. Let's put it that way. Um, no. So, so hey. no, I, a funny anecdote about that. So when I was like, oh, like two or three, uh, an, an aunt and uncle bought me a poster because they knew I like cars. So they bought me a poster of Mustangs, one for each year. So, you know, like classic Mustangs, these are, these are Mustangs, these are cool, except they're, car they're Mustangs from the seventies. So you had like, you know, Mach one, that's cool. And then it went downhill from there. Just, it went from morbidly obese to the Mustang to ending with the rinky dink Fox body. It's like this, it, I wish I still had it cause it would be just be gloriously ironic, but that's my aside in showing that the Mustang in the seventies, not great. Not great. 73 is the last one. If you watch the original Gun in 60 Seconds movie, uh, the car chase scene is basically an homage to the 73, uh, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, I would disagree with you. I kind of like the Fox bodies. I think those, they have a certain charm. I will say this, in the moment, I mean, I remember people in high school had them. I mean, it was like a very ubiquitous car, especially growing up in Michigan. Like, there was nothing special about them, but I think time has maybe healed some of the wounds. Um, people, I mean, I, I'll say this, my parents had a, like an 84 and it was a piece of junk. It went through two transmissions and like, there was nothing sporty about it other than it, it did look kind of cool, but, but yeah, but I, see, I feel like see, time there is, were, but there were, but there were versions of it that were cool. But yeah, like, if you, if yeah. you like, you look at some like, you know, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact year, but there's like, you know, an 80 or 81, like, Mustang Ghia. It's brown, and it has the, the like, the egg crate front um, with grill on it, and, it, and it's like a notch back with a vinyl roof, and it is, it is weedy. It is, that is, that is not good. That was not the, you know, the, the later Turbo 4 uh, versions and, and all that. Yeah, you know, the one the ones that people would actually enjoy having. There there were some unfortunate moments with that one. Even There's, into the nineties, the probe was actually the better performance car than the Mustang. Oh yeah. If you were looking for a couple of years anyway in the Ford mm -hmm. stable. If the you first will. Mustang I ever drove with my was my wife's like ooh, like ninety nine or two thousand. It was like the last, the last body style before it went retro. And she had the V6 one. And uh, it wasn't very good. <laughs> the one before it went retro, that. that one before it went retro is one that I have not fully warmed up to. I, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's like, it's, to me, that's almost like the 90s version of the, the Mustang 2. You know, like they weren't sure what to do with it. Um... I don't know. I mean, I, I, a guy who lives near me has a Mach 1, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's got some aftermarket stuff on it. Uh, I, you know, that, I think that's a legitimately cool car, but anything short of that, that body style, that's no thank you. Well, you know, it, it's an, it brings up an interesting point because, like, 
Okay, so the okay, well, let's put aside the fact that it's a crossover, and you know the Maki is a crossover, and you know you could say, oh, it doesn't look like a Mustang. Well, the Mustang didn't look like a Mustang from 1974 until what, 05? <laughs> it looked totally different. So, you know, it doesn't have to look like a 1964 Mustang to be a Mustang. Yeah. That's a fair point. I think you know as you really look forward and maybe we're getting into like, you know, I don't know, but I'd be like, where do they go next? They've done the retro thing. Like you look at Dodge with the challenger. There was only one really good generation of challenger. What do they do next for the style? If they do mm -hmm. a big departure, people are going to say, well, that's not a challenger, no matter how awesome it looks. And I think yeah. Mustang, they're not in that. Like, I don't think they're in that lane yet, but no. they've been retro in the car right now, I think is, I mean, I'd say this current retro style is about, it's gone as far as it could go. They might want to look at trying something new. I don't know if they can, though. Um, the Mustang may be getting into almost like 911 territory now, yeah. where you can't really change it that much because the purists will get too, you know, too mad. I don't know. But Maybe you don't need to. Maybe you don't yeah, need that's, to. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Look what Chevy tried to do with the Camaro. Actually, I don't know what they tried to do besides possibly, we want to make this hideous. Um, but they, they got such amazing blowback on it that they, they took back that big black flow tie on the, uh, on the SS. I actually liked the look of that car, to be perfectly oh. honest. I did. I, oh. you know, it's funny when you talk about like, let's call it automotive architecture. I like the big grills on like the BMWs. I think it works in some narrow cases. Let me put it that way. Not on all of them. I think it's retro. It reminds me of cars like from the 30s. Like they're almost like radiators, which is like what a grill was intended to be, you know, let those things like let out all the engine components breathe. But I don't know. I, I have some very odd taste when it comes to like strange design cues. I think it's, you know, I, I give them credit for taking a risk. I think in some ways, I think Joel, our, uh, our news editor, Joel Stocksdale, made a point that that like one model year of Camaro, maybe it's a collector's item, you know, who oh, knows? Well, well, yeah, it will be any one off yeah. thing. Yeah. Know, it, <laughs> it goes without I, saying. I think yeah. they should still sell it as an option. I would like, if I were a Camaro buyer, like I would at least look at that and be like, well, that looks interesting. It would definitely be a love it or hate it. Like, I think I want it. No, heck no, I don't want it. Move on. But I mean, also, like, what does it cost them to have it on there other than it costs them, like, us, you know, yelling at them and saying this doesn't look very good, but that's the pony car segment. Yeah. Anything else on the Mach-E? No. No. All right. I, I, I really, really like it. it it's, I, I look forward to driving uh, the GT. Uh, I'd be interest, interested to drive the rear-wheel drive one with just the, the regular range battery. Um, just, it's a, it's a really impressive effort and I hope to see a lot more interesting, um, desirable electric cars in the future. And I, and, you know, we're getting them, they're, they're going to be coming and, you know, I, I it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. I, I look forward to them. I agree with that. And I think, um, just, we'll talk about CES in a little bit here, but the GM preview, the Celestic which I thought looked great. And I think Cadillac, a great way to flip the conversation for them is they're going to go, they've sort of said they're going to go all electric. I don't really know if they're going to actually do that, that as quickly as they say they will or how, what all electric means. You know, there's a lot of ways you could kind of like hedge on that, but what a great idea. Like right now you have like these like German performance sedans that aren't selling very well. And then you've got the Escalade, you've got some other things. You want to really just just leapfrog, but we're all electric, and look at how amazing these cars look. Mm -hmm. Good yeah, call. Well, I mean, I think that's a great play. Invest there. Don't keep trying to iterate on what you've been doing. No. I mean, it, it, to, the, to the brand point, the Cadillac brand is stronger than the cars themselves. Really? So, I mean, people think, ooh, if you say, ooh, I have a Cadillac, the Cadillac has some, like, it still has some gravitas to it. Oh, yeah. Even though the cars themselves, I, I don't think, you know, in the cool factor really deliver that aside from the Escalade. So, you I would, know, you could really, you could really just create some really fanciful out there grand 
uh, electric cars to get noticed. You know, the Cadillacs of electric cars. They need to make that. Make the Cadillacs of electric cars. <laughs> it's right there. There you go. I mean, that's, I agree with that completely. I actually totally side note here. I haven't driven a CT4 or a CT, I haven't driven a CT4, and I'm very intrigued to drive one just because I think, does it look stunning? No. But I feel like if, like a brand that maybe has a little more of a like base right now and more credibility, like in the luxury space, like current credibility and coolness, not historic, if you will, rolled out that design. I think we, a lot of people would be falling all over it. Um, so I'm intrigued. Yeah. I haven't driven I, it. It's on my I list liked of it things. A lot. Like, I thought it was yeah. exceptional. I really liked it a lot. Um, now it's very similar to the CT5. Right. CT5 is just a little bigger, and I didn't like the CT5 because of the interior. The two basically have the same interior quality, but one starts at 33000 and the other one is more expensive than that, and at the lower price point, it works more. Um, but the other thing is, it has the CT4, because it starts at the price it does, it has this rear drive platform, it is a little bigger, so it really stands strong against like a Mercedes A-Class or that BMW 2 Series Grand, uh, Grand Coupe or uh, Audi A3. Like it, it just makes such a strong case for itself and it's really good to drive. It's a, it's a really fun, legitimate sports sedan and there's not many of those anymore. Um, so I, I was very impressed with, with that car. And I think it looks good. There's, that's the thing. It has a, there's a taste level for Cadillac styling now. Um, it's, it's very classic, very clean. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's better than it's been in oh, a very, very long time. Um, I think there's ways they can like, modify it a little bit. But I would compare it like the early 2010 cars, if you will. Those were like... 50s Cadillacs with the fins and the creases and all of carbon fiber coming out of every end and like mesh foil grills. Then it seems like now with this new decade, if you will, this feels more like 60s Cadillacs, which mm -hmm. were toned down. They didn't have the fins or as dramatic of fins. Just they sort of traded more on like being a Cadillac, a little more understated like elegance, you know? And yep. I think that was cool. So mm -hmm. I wish, so I, wish the, I wish the interiors had that same kind of feel to them. Like, yeah. they, like, they need to be a little more Lincoln in that regard. Like, have the exteriors match. They, the, the, they, it looks like they put a lot of effort and they had an idea of what they wanted to be outside, to be distinctive, yet tasteful. The interior design is very last-generation BMW. Um, so and that's not a great thing. I think, um, what yeah, I think not, is not really not, not a, from a design perspective. No. Right. It's interesting when you look at Lincoln, just how much we all generally like their interiors and the mm -hmm. navigator, especially the aviator is quite good. Uh, I was in a Nautilus. That was a while ago, but I was very nice inside. Part of me wonders if Lincoln is sort of really getting like, they're nailing the interiors right at a time when the interior may all be changing. And this is kind of what we'll talk about here in CES is it's all screens. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about 33 inch, 56 inch screens, three screens, like everything's a big screen and there's not as much simple, just like leather structural components or structural components covered in like leather and stitching. So for me, I think that's where Cadillac could just maybe say, you know what? We haven't really gotten interiors right. <laughs> And I don't quite Ever. know when. Let's just <laughs> let's just go go ahead. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I remember well, there was a great great quote from Bob Lutz who was like, "We spent a ton of money on these interiors to make them look expensive. They just didn't, or something mm -hmm. like to that effect." And it was like, "Yeah, I get it." Um, yeah. Well, the but maybe well, that's the, the play. To be fair, the Escalade would show that. Yes. Someone knows what's up, mm -hmm. and it, there's just a delay here, which is yeah. totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of saw that with Lincoln. The Continental came out, and, like they had the exterior design, and they had the idea that okay, we're going to have black label, we're going to have interesting colors, and yada yada. Uh, but then the interior is just like anonymous. 
they then correct it with Navigator, and that's what we're seeing thereafter. But to your point about uh, like big screens, if you look at the interior of the Aviator, the Navigator, it does have the uh, you know big screen slap to the dashboard thing, so it could get bigger probably very easily. It's not like um, say. Uh, like the Ford F-150, for example, that they need to completely like re-engineer the dashboard to swallow a larger screen. Or like you, you see with like the Jag F-Pace, they needed to actually literally bring the screen out of the dashboard um, because of enlarged screens. So I think uh, if Lincoln wanted to uh, answer the Escalade, it wouldn't take heavy surgery there. It's interesting when you talk about spending money, like maybe wasting money on interior, the Continental had like a good seats could be adjusted almost any way you wanted. There were all these like fancy gizmos that didn't really do anything. They looked great in a press release, but didn't really do anything for the driver and the passenger, at least not much. And then a few years later, here come these SUVs that like are gorgeous. I mean, inside and out. So so yeah, that's the state of luxury interiors, American style, I guess. Uh, what'd you think of that plug-in F one fifty you had? Oh, it's lovely. Just yeah? the 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 um, just the F one fifty in general. I mean, it's I I literally have a, a call in about an hour with Ford to find out more about what they did with it because the press because the releases were a little thin on information. After driving it, it sure seemed a lot more updated than they indicated. Uh, specifically, uh, the steering was a lot more precise and it sure felt quicker, although they didn't release the ratio, so I have no idea if that's true at this point. Um, but just generally speaking, the, the, the new F-150 seems a little smaller behind the wheel, even though it absolutely isn't. Um, feels more, a little more SUV-like. Um, it doesn't overwhelm as much when you're driving in a city kind of like the Ram 1500 in that way. Um, I really enjoyed driving it. The, the driving positions also, it seemed like the seat was a little lower, the, the wheel telescoped more. Um, just m more comfortable, less truckish to drive. Um, the plug-in hybrid, fantastic. Uh, you, it's not very hybrid-y, which I think if you're Mr. Truck Guy and you don't want something that's totally weird, that's a good thing. Um, has a ton of power, incredibly smooth. I was getting, uh, upper 19 point something miles per gallon, making no effort to drive in an economical way. Um, this contrasts to the Ram TRX, where I was getting 10.2, um, so, you know, not that those are competitors, nevertheless. Um, yeah, really impressed. Uh, the F-150, big time improvement. The interior, speaking of interiors, uh, I had the Platinum. The leather everywhere. Um, it had, um, you know, the, these, these fancy seats that were, they do, um, they're not just the regular F-150 seats. Um, they literally look different. Um, uh, you know, lives up. It's a luxury truck. It's a luxury truck. It has a gigantic price tag, and it is even more luxurious than the last one. So, um, you know, I came away very impressed with that truck in general. Yeah. And it, it gets more power. It, it's more powerful than the top of the line 3.5 liter um, EcoBoost. Yet it gets um, the same or better fuel economy than the diesel. How is that a bad thing? That's a great thing. It's the one to get. Yeah, I I don't disagree. And I think I was a little be I would say I was being a little tongue in cheek there. Like people are like, well, it's not really a Mustang. It's it's a it's electric, mm -hmm. you know. And with the F one fifty, I mean, obviously part of it is the body style, but I think that really speaks to like how just where electrification is going, like. If you could get more performance, why wouldn't you want it? You know, like if you could get things that, you know, do their jobs in an even better way or a different way that's more interesting, perhaps more sustainable. I mean, why these don't seem like bad things yeah. to me. Um, mm -hmm. So, well, yeah. So it gets, so they upgraded the 3.5 liter EcoBoost 
for this year to 400 horsepower and 500 pound-feet of torque. The Power Boost, the hybrid, gets 430 horsepower and 570. And gets 25 miles per gallon, or 24 miles per gallon combined with the 4x4. Uh, I wasn't getting that. But nevertheless, um, that's a pretty exceptional combination right there. So I would say your fuel economy was just a bit better than what you achieved with the TRX. I'm guessing, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I got, I got 10.2 nice, with the TRX. Nice, nice. So you sort of balanced yeah. out your carbon footprint a little bit? Yeah, I got to tell you, I, well, I didn't drive the TRX that much because of it. I drove it enough, but, you know, uh, if you're talking about like a Lamborghini or some other silly thing that gets 10.5 miles per gallon, right? If you're lucky, that thing will go 5,000 miles in its lifetime. No one's driving it enough, really, for your carbon footprint to make... It doesn't really matter. It's just, it's, just a, it's, it's just a pretty thing that sits in the garage. The TRX, however, is probably going to be driven. It can be like a daily driver, and it's just wildly irresponsible. Furthermore, you don't need remotely anywhere close to that much power in that truck. I, I mean, you, you just don't. You, you, you can, you're going awfully fast without even coming close to full throttle in that thing. I'm far more impressed with the suspension on that, both in terms of the amazing things it can do off-road. I mean, we, our, our uh, Jeremy Krasniewski, he, he actually took the thing off-road. I didn't. Dead Edmonds looked at the, the suspension and the suspension deep dive, shows how cool what's going on underneath there. And as, an, a, as, as a happy uh, side effect, it's incredibly comfortable. That truck, very, very comfortable. It has that long travel initial uh, suspension, or sorry, long initial suspension travel that makes it pretty darn comfortable when you're just driving around uh, the streets. So uh, I like that element. The engine element, okay, that's nice. It has a Hellcat engine, but it's, it's overkill. It's unnecessary. Um, so... You, you, I, I would, I would really, I would like the TRX if they had that a lot of that same uh, chassis and suspension upgrades with just the the V8 with their e torque system. That would be great. Yeah, fair enough. I you made me uh, kind of spiral here into looking up Lamborghini fuel economies. So the TRX, <laughs> you got ten point two. It's rated at twelve combined. 10 city, 14 highway. A 1986 Lamborghini Countach is rated at seven combined. So it's not as close as I was hoping. <laughs> Six city, 10 highway though. So, I mean, highway numbers, like who knows? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So here, here's, here's the difference um, with the Raptor, the TRX versus the Raptor. Um, according to the EPA, it would cost you $1,500 more per year to fill a TRX than a Raptor. Hmm. Per year. It's a fair amount of money. $1,500. That is insane for fuel economy numbers. That Per year. That is... <laughs> can't underline how insane that is. <laughs> All right. So in my straw man argument, it would cost you double to fill up an 86 Countach versus a 2021 Ram TRX. So, you know, there's some cars that beats in fuel economy. It costs over 25 grand to drive the 86 Lambo versus, you know, about 12 grand for the TRX. So, <laughs> yeah. Bring in the strangeness here. Um, touch briefly here on the Genesis GV80, which I drove last week. I really enjoyed it. I would say this is the Genesis, or among the Genesis vehicles I've been most excited to get into it's certainly it definitely brings this new level of design um language to their you know their lineup here of crossovers and suvs i literally stared at it for two days it arrived on a monday and i didn't really have any errands or anything to do for a couple of days so i literally stared at it for like two days and there's all these design elements like the grill the like these like like strafing things on the sides the headlights it's just, you know, obviously Google it, check it out on our site. It is not a conventional looking 
crossover. I kept literally thinking it reminded me of almost like a baby Ventaga or something. Perhaps that's too high of <laughs> praise, but I thought it looked great. Um, and everybody who walked by walking their dogs would look at it. And that's like the test I do when I'm, you know, lurking in my window, observing what's going on in the neighborhood. It's like, okay, um, wow, that person looked at the car, that person didn't, you know? So just that very mm -hmm. unscientific thing. It looks great. It drove very well. Um, steering was a little, like, I'd say kind of heavier than I would have thought. It seemed like it maybe was perhaps artificially boosted, but good looking vehicle. Um, Got plenty of stuff in there. Did a little bit of shopping. It. What I think is interesting for Genesis is if you see this crossover, I think it would make you look at it and think, wow, that's beautiful. I might want to buy that. And then you would say it's a Genesis. And then your next question is probably, wait, what's a Genesis? So I think by like basically going down that like almost like psychological exercise, I think that means it's, it is a success for Genesis because it's going to get people interested in their brand who may not know what it is. And in that sense, that I think harks back to the original, like Hyundai Genesis, when they made that like, really like, I mean, it was a large sedan back in, I want to say 08, 09. And, you know, they sort of hinted, hey, we're going to move this off to uh, be its own luxury brand someday. But right now we're just going to give you like, like S class level of features at like 30 something thousand dollars like it was outrageous the amount of stuff you got on that car and it was totally a get you in this is how good we could be and then stay with us we're gonna grow and to me this feels like a little bit more like a higher evolution of genesis um so i really liked it you know again it sounds like mm -hmm. I think I drove it a little more than maybe you drove the trx but i, I mean honestly i didn't drive it a ton um you know very nice vehicle i think Right now, I've I've been very impressed with Hyundai. You know, they the G70 is lovely car to drive. Uh, you know, very nice dynamics. Um, it's been a while, to be perfectly honest. So much so that I I can't recall the last Genesis I drove and was like, Ugh, I don't know about this. You know, like they seem to be they're achieving this like, you know, consistent level of you know, very nice, very premium feeling vehicles, and I think. You know, people don't believe me when I say, hey, you should check that out. You know, it's a good value. They look good. The interiors are nice. They have a lot of interesting safety features on there. Uh, you might be interested in it. So, and they're taking risks, which I think is more than you could say for a lot of luxury brands. So, I don't know. I liked my week in it. I drove it. I know you actually spent, I guess, some time in one, as in you like crawled all over it and did some shortcuts and stuff like that. Um, what did you think of your static yeah, I got test? A, I got a sneak. Pr yeah, I got like a pre-production model that couldn't be driven on public roads. Mm. So, so as you... we don't have a test track here in Oregon, uh, I needed to just kind of stick to a parking lot and look at the interior. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned the Bentayga because Genesis, the head of their design, is the former designer for Bentley. And you can totally tell look at the, looking at these things. And I would offer that the GV80 is a much better, more cohesive design than the actual Bentley SUV. Um, the interior is absolutely lovely in this car. And I believe you had the, well, you call it British Racing Green, but it's in fact Cardiff Green, mm. which makes it Welsh Green. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's Welsh Touring Green, perhaps. Uh, but yes. And it, did it have the really cool all green interior? No, it did not. It was more of like a tan oh. interior, but still quite nice. Oh. Still quite we'll nice. See, we'll see if I get what I know. I'm getting the Cardiff green car in March. We'll see if that has the matching green interior. Because that thing's pretty cool. Like the, the upper level Genesis. Genesis? 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 Uh, I don't they, know. Phil Collins yeah. um, just has the like the really fancy color ones so the gv80 has the green one and the g80 has the blue interior and I, I got to see that one that one's that one's pretty special too um and the 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 gv oh god what's the number of the new one 
I completely the, the the compact one. I now don't know. Is it GV seventy? The I was gonna guess forty, but I feel like I'm going too low. Yes, GV seventy. GV70. That one. Seventy. Uh, it has a purple interior. Okay. All right. Fun. Sign me up for that one. That one's gonna be great. It's a good looking car. And the, yeah, it's a, it's a neat looking that that the new GV seventy. Um, isn't just a miniature GV80. Common with Hyundai, they're not just doing the Russian nesting doll thing where every single one looks identical. Like, I, I can't tell an E-Class apart from a C-Class. Or, like, I, I saw a CLS driving the other day, and I thought someone put a CLS badge on a CLA. I, I, I didn't think it was that different. So... I really appreciate when car companies are actually trying to make their cars look different from each other. Um, and I, Genesis is carrying on from the kind of a common corporate um, ethos. Um, ditto the interior. Google the interior of the GV70 and throw Autoblog on the end of it, and you'll see the pretty cool interiors that the GV70 has, including the one that's purple. One thing I should mention since I actually drove the thing, 375 horsepower turbo engine, very nice. I mm. almost didn't even realize that I had the twin turbo. It's a 3.5 liter V6. At first, I just kind of jumped in the car and was like, as usual, running late to pick up my pizza. And then it was like, oh, wait a minute. I have the turbo V6. Sweet. Um, so it was very nice. Uh, Genesis. And in Hyundai, they use this engine in a few things, but it's it's a very good engine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was surprised how yeah, sturdy it was. Yeah, I had the four cylinder and the G eighty. It's a big displacement four cylinder, two point five liters. It's not just the usual two liter. Um, that was really impressive too. Doesn't it? You know, the extra displacement um, certainly makes it feel more V six like than you typically get from you know four-cylinder turbo engines, which is appropriate for a larger mid-size car. You know, the, the power outputs of a two-liter turbo could be appropriate, but there's just always something, both in terms of the way it, it, it responds and the way it sounds, and frankly, just, the, you know, having a two-liter turbo in a mid-size large luxury sedan just doesn't seem right. There's a bit of a cognitive dissonance there, so the, having a little extra displacement does help. Sounds good. I uh, think we had a very robust uh, review section here. Let's uh, jump into a couple of news hits here. Um, CES was this week, 2021. Uh, it's the first year we haven't sent anyone in quite a while because there's no place to go. It's all virtual. Check out our coverage. I'll mainly just tease this out. But like we were talking about earlier, one of the big themes this year really was the dashboards, at least from the automotive side of things. There's a million TVs and drones and dust busters and any other thing. But, you know, BMW with sort of an iteration of iDrive, it, they didn't do much. Mercedes hyperscreen, definitely worth checking out. It's, uh, it's gorgeous. It's going to go in the EQS, which is a sort of, it, which is the S class of their electric line, if you will. Uh, but it's going to be an expensive one because it's going to be like an option in the EQS. So, I mean, just think about that. If you're like in the looking at like a GLS or an S class, what's not standard, then you have to pay extra for it. Like it's it's going to be an expensive uh, screen. Let's put it that way. But it's beautiful and it has AI. It has uh, OLED technology. Uh, something like I know what I'm talking about here. Um, very impressive screen. A uh, couple other big things. General Motors showed all kinds of different things. They rolled out uh, this partnership uh, with FedEx that's going to involve like electric um, vehicle or electric vans uh, called Bright Drop. So check that out. We have a story on that. Some interesting teasers of the Celestic or the Celestique, as I like to sort of say. It reminds me of a French ocean liner from the 1950s, we'll say. Maybe it'll win the blue ribbon for fastest transatlantic crossing more on uh in other gm things uh let's see they're just basically going to be very electric going forward um i was impressed with ces this year from a virtual standpoint too in some ways the news seemed a little more 
I don't know, precise. Uh, other years, it's just so much. It's like sensory overload. This year, it was like, okay, you know, here's the virtual presser and away you go. So um, I'm not the biggest CES person in the world, to be perfectly honest. But without the Detroit Auto Show this year, I, it had my full attention. So, you know, those were kind of my takeaways. Yeah, I can't say I've never been to CES. I'm, I would be basically a Luddite if I went there. You know, I went for the good enough iPhone rather than the latest and greatest one, and I'll probably keep it for six years. And frankly, I'm uh, totally okay if my toaster doesn't talk to my toilet over the Internet of Things. So, you know, probably not really, not really my... My, my game what, uh, in that way. I, I still listen to the radio and lament that they don't put CD players in cars. So you know, I'm 37 going on 80. I'll say this. A CD player really offers a beautiful sound if you, if you must. I mean, everybody talks about vinyl, and that's great. Vinyl is, you know, great, certainly. You know, my parents had a lot of records from the 60s and 70s, but CDs are great. The CES discussion mm-hmm. is really going back uh, the longer we take it. Mm-hmm. Yep. So let's talk about the Jeep Grand Cherokee L, uh, revealed last week, and it's a very large vehicle. That's sort of my takeaway from this. You did a nice comparison chart. Um, it's larger than I thought it would be. I actually thought they would yeah. shoehorn a third row in there and call it a day, but this is like a legit competitor. It's I believe, I think you wrote this, it's longer than the Traverse. And that thing is an ocean yeah. liner of a vehicle. So yeah. how much stuff do you think you can put in this thing? Well, the thing is, so yes, it is longer than a Traverse. It is like eight inches longer than a Palisade, which itself is a really long vehicle. Sorry, eight inches longer specifically, exactly, than a Telluride, which is really big itself. Thing is, though, at least in terms of the specs, it doesn't seem that that's really proportional to the interior space. In fact, in terms of its third row room, it has one of the smallest third rows among those larger three row SUVs. Um, Same with the cargo capacity, Um, at least with right behind the third row. And it's actually almost more like a pilot in that regard. I think, however, it's one of those things you don't know until you actually get into the car, which we can't do. Um, But I think it's because because it's a Jeep. They need to have room underneath the floor for the proper four-wheel drive system and just just, just the equipment that a Jeep requires. The current Grand Cherokee has a higher load floor than other crossovers because it is a crossover it's a unibar it's a unibody uh, suv as it always has been the grand cherokee um so i think that's why so it order it needed to kind of be that big in order for it to still be competitive and the other thing is a lot of the length difference could be the result of a longer front end because it needs to be able to stuff a v8 inside and obviously a palisade and a telluride and name your other thing doesn't need to do that so that could be an element going on here um but to to agree with you completely yes it was a lot bigger than than we all kind of expected the other thing is we we thought it was interesting that just they they're introducing the next generation Grand Cherokee here, which is a long time coming. It's been more than a decade now, uh, as the three row model, instead of just the regular Grand Cherokee. And if you look at the sales of two row versus three row midsize SUVs, it's pretty obvious obvious why they do that. Uh, the Traverse outsells the the Blazer by a huge amount. The Explorer obliterates the edge. Um, the Honda Pilot crushes the Honda Passport. Um, so it's kind of easy to see why they decided to bring the L out first, because it's probably going to sell better. Um, even, you know, Chrysler, this is the first three-row Grand Cherokee, but Chrysler or whatever it's currently being known on a corporate level at the moment, um, 
had one in this segment. It was the Grand. It was the Durango, which was basically just a free row Grand Cherokee with in Dodge clothes and a drab interior. Well, there's now going to be. It's still living. It's going to keep on going. They even redesigned the interior for 2021 to not be so drab. So they're going to now have two vehicles in the segment, uh, one quite old and one brand spanking new. It's interesting. It, to me, it's an obvious play for Jeep. One that they probably, it took them a while to sort of come to this like three row party, if you will. And I think really have some awareness that this is where you make your money in this sort of segment here. Uh, I've been to the factory in Detroit, Jefferson North, where they build Durangos and Grand Cherokees. And it was baffling. I was like, well, like literally I remember I was there on a tour once and somebody who was not in the industry was like, well, where's your three row Grand Cherokee? And they were so caught off guard. And I was like, well, this is awesome. Maybe they're going to break some news here and tell us, you know, like just somebody might say, well, actually we're working on that. So to me, it's like really getting the obvious answer to, you know, a really you know important question. Um, it's, I think it looks good. I think they, um, I would have liked to have seen them maybe make this vehicle a little bit wider. It's just going on your chart here. Uh, it's still like about 77 or so inches. And currently it's, uh, let's see, currently it's about 76 to 77 inches. Um, that was one of the issues I thought when, when I was, we were actually looking for a three row SUV. Uh, it looks like you got it is 77.9. So it's a little bit wider than the current model. Um, but it's a pretty narrow interior. It's like, I mean, basically we would have thought about buying one when my wife was pregnant and we had a dog. We're like, Grand Cherokee makes a lot of sense. And then we got into one and we're like, oh, wow, geez, this is pretty close quarters. The dog's tail doesn't even fit in the thing, you know, granted I have a Mm -hmm. 60 pound golden retriever, but you know, so I guess we'll see. I mean, sometimes you've really got to get inside these things and see just like how much room is in there. Like, can you spread stuff out? You know, how like, how bolstered are the seats and the doors? There's, you know, a, a real world, you know, application to it. Um, but I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic because I think this is a good opportunity for Jeep, for Stellantis, if you will. I feel like we should stay Stellantis a few times since it just clicks so well in all of our stories. Stellantis or Stellantis, I guess, perhaps. I don't know. Stellantis. Stellantis. We're, we're from, we're, we're, we're respectively from Michigan and Ontario. <laughs> we can say Stellantis. You can get that uh, nasal uh, vowel yeah. in there for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think they got it right. I, they didn't take many risks otherwise. You know, the powertrains were not surprising. There was nothing in here that I really... The same. You know, yeah, exactly. Thought, you know, might be unconventional, but they'll probably sell yeah, a well, ton of know, them. Well, you know, it is disappointing. Like, just come to think about it. Like, it is the same. Like, how come this thing doesn't have an e-torque system? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, it, it kind of needs it because um, this has the least amount of horsepower and torque in um, amongst the Explorer, Telluride, Palisade, Reverse, these larger three-row crossovers, yet it weighs the most by a lot. It's like 500 pounds more than a Telluride, despite having just a little bit less, basically having the same amount of power. Um, It's, again, like 600 pounds more, uh, is 600 pounds heavier than an Explorer ST. So with the V8, I should say. Um, So it still weighs a whole lot, yet didn't really get any sort of powertrain upgrade for the purposes of performance or just the purposes of modernity. What I think is interesting too, you know, you mentioned earlier how the three row, geez, I was called a Wagoneer, Grand Cherokee, caught us off guard, it was because they sort of soft, like sold it, if you will. When I was thinking Jeep three row, I was thinking Grand Wagoneer. That's what I was thinking. They're getting back in the three row segment. They're going to bring this big Tahoe suburban expedition competitor in. The first thing that came to mind wasn't, oh, hey, we're going to wedge a third row into the Jeep, you know, and then sort of, you know, articulating that it was going to get to be a little bit larger lengthwise. you know, that 
that adds clarity. Let's put it that way. But there's a lot of Jeep SUVs now, as I think about it. In some of them, you've got like Grad Wagoneer, Wagoneer, Grad Cherokee, Grand Cherokee L. It seems like there's going to be a little bit of overlap. Uh, they're going to position the Wagoneer as more of a like a luxury vehicle. I think that's starting to become clearer mm-hmm. as we really see what they're thinking. But the Grand Cherokee is not cheap right now either. Like, you know, a base model, sure, that's fine. Um, but it's pretty basic. And then add a few options, step up a couple trims, and it gets pretty expensive. So, oh, yeah. Well, a, a Grand Cherokee L Summit. Uh, cost starts at fifty four thousand. Uh, a Lincoln Aviator starts at like fifty fifty one. Yeah. Uh, which is why I threw the Aviator yeah. in on this comparison chart because they're you know, they, they are competitive at that point. What's interesting too is I would wager that the Aviator's interior is much better than the Jeeps, no matter how how Jeepy and you know outdoorsy they make it. I would think the Aviator's interior is is much cooler. Um, and it's also we'll see i think it it looks cooler but it looks pretty uh, the summit looks pretty swank okay. inside all right it looks looks pretty pretty nice well here's the other thing the aviator is in looks like nearly 10 inches wider so um yeah that's oh, that's a large it should vehicle. be bigger inside yeah. it also has 400 horsepower yeah. whereas the v8 uh the hemi grand cherokee has 357 so you know what um, though i tell you what is like there are a million grand cherokees on the road around metro detroit it's like the suv of choice if you will around here because it's you can get one load it up and it's your luxury vehicle or get a basic one and you're still driving a grand cherokee they are going to sell a ton of these is my guess mm -hmm. um you know it's because it's it's cool but it's also expensive it's a jeep i mean it's it's a smart move no matter how well it ends up grading out if you will would we get our hands on it and say well look at this or look at that so so that is the grand cherokee l speaking of l i think we've run a little long here let's uh let's get to the mailbag all right speaking of grand cherokees uh the writer offers up hey i've had three cheap grand cherokees one came off lease and decided to commit to another one most cars offer Driving modes, auto, normal, snow, mud, rock, sport, etc. But what I want the most on periodic long ski trips or college visits is a comfort mode. I love this parenthetical here. Uh, like a 74 Caddy. Doesn't everyone? Well, I don't know if everybody wants that level of comfort, but sure, why not? Uh, we ended up leasing a 2020 Acura MDX, coincidentally, for the same out-of-pocket cost. And yes, it has comfort mode. Ride's great. Front and back seats. Uh, it's got the soft active dampers uh, that are obviously good. We like those. Driving eight hours north uh, is less terrible. Comfort mode isn't numerically measured, uh, he points out, and reviewed. Why isn't this done? That's the question. Furthermore, why not offer a comfort mode in every car? It will add zero cost and satisfaction. We're talking off camera, off microphone here, that this is actually a really good question. Why don't we have more comfort modes? And why don't maybe we as car journalists measure it? I mean, I guess I do measure it. I measure it as in I'm really comfortable. It's pretty good. That's the line in my mm -hmm. story. And then I move on. Um, yeah. Back in my younger days, I used to, you know, maybe say if I was hungover, comfort mode was the road, you know, the mode <laughs> that you punched up. I don't know. Um, but what do you think? How do you measure comfort mode? Well, uh, uh, does, does some chassis engineer have an answer for you on that? Yeah, probably. Actually, um, yeah. But I'm not do. one, so I don't. Uh, the other thing is comfort is so subjective. You know, like, I often say that, like, the original Acura NSX was, like, shockingly comfortable. A another editor at the time drove it, who was not as much of a car person, and thought it was, like, horribly uncomfortable. So, you know, these things are very relative. The other thing is uh, comfort mode. A lot of times, most of the time actually, comfort mode is tied to other elements. 
So yes, the suspension is as comfortable as it could be. However, it's attached to like suck steering. That is just inert and terrible and I want nothing to do with it. And like no throttle response to speak of. Um, so if you do have the situations where you can break it out and give me the, co the comfy suspension with the regular throttle response and the good steering, great. Those are often cars I enjoy and I do like setting cars to that level. But even then, often comfort mode, the comfort uh, suspension mode, isn't really like 74 Cadillac. There's only one car or brand that actually does that and quite appropriately, it's Lincoln. Like the last MKC, the only MKC, you could upgrade it with this adaptive suspension and God love them, comfort was legit like 78 Continental. It was, it was like floaty and marshmallowy and it was so amusing and so different. I drove around with it just for the novelty. Um, and it was just like very refreshing. So to that point, I absolutely agree that more cars should come with a legit comfort mode. However, it might not be possible because despite the fact, despite the availability of adaptive dampers, that still might not make it possible for you to go from M3 to 78 Continental with a press of a button. That's, that's just, it's just highly, again, not a, not a chassis engineer here, but I'm just guessing that's not really uh, in the cards. Um, so is it possible to that level? Probably not. To the, the fact that it would add zero cost, I don't think that's accurate either. Um, however, in principle, I absolutely agree that having the option for a comfort mode on the suspension is very good. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it's interesting how you think about how you remember things. Uh, 78 Lincoln probably was pretty comfy, but a lot of work to steer and stop and handle uh, otherwise, which may have put you on edge. It didn't do any of those things, yeah. actually. It, it didn't really hand, no. The answer was no right. under the review. You coasted to like <laughs> a stop somewhere into dry dock or something. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting uh, question. And I, the answer is a little murky. Um, it's probably expensive. I also think, too, there's certain segments that doesn't matter. You know, you're not going to need that. It's not a universal thing. Uh, on some luxury cars, though, just like, uh, you know, it'd be an interesting exercise, like, for somebody to really hang their hat on and say, we have comfort mode. I don't know. Let's just say Genesis, because we were both talking about them. We offer you a level of comfort you can't get anywhere else. Like, we're talking like Serta, like, you know, lazy boy levels of like, this is your rolling, like, sofa, you know. And maybe it does multiple things, you know, maybe comfort mode also, it could be tailored, you know, like you could, massages are pretty common now uh, in Genesis and Mercedes and a number of vehicles. You hit comfort mode, the suspension goes like marshmallowy, the massage starts, you get like the seat heaters go up to like a mid-level just to kind of relax you or something. Uh, you could do a number of things. Now, I know the writer is asking, probably how could you tune that suspension to be exactly how comfort should hit and it is all very subjective but it's i think it's a great question it also reminds me of uh geez to go back to our mustang discussion i forget what kind of car it was but i had a friend in high school who had something it could have been a geo for all i know that had a sport mode that did absolutely nothing he hit sport <laughs> mode and it made the exhaust sound like worse so i mean some of it i think is you know, it, it can be a little bit mental, you know, do you think it's more comfortable than sure more comfortable, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, comfort just hasn't been as like the BMW vacation yeah. of cars to try to make them, you know, performance has sold in the luxury segment very much and handling's very important. And, you know, everybody's taking cars to the Nürburgring Cadillac for some reason feels the need to out BMW, BMW and, when, meanwhile, they're all abandoning comfort, um, even Lexus, uh, you know. So there is definitely room for car companies to go, hmm, maybe people would like to drive eight hours in smooth, buttery comfort. And I do think 
wrapping this up that Genesis does that, as does Lincoln? Great question. Um, please send us your questions, your spend my monies, or just any questions. It's, it's kind of fun to go through the mailbag and see what people are thinking. Uh, that's all the time we have this week. James, thanks for joining us. We'll see you guys next week.